Hello again, 110. In this particular video, I'm going to go over the terms for Chapter 6, the Presidency. And with all of these defined terms, you should be able to answer the questions from the syllabus and the block that we are in right now for September 25th through October the 1st. Summarize the constitutional origins and power of the president. Explain the rise of presidential government. Describe that type of government, and then you can be able to assess the power of the president today. It'll be pretty obvious what the answer to that question is. The constitutional origins come out of Article 2, and the intent was for a weak president. Article 1, Congress, since they dealt with that first, they wanted the Congress to be the most important branch, and it was for much of American history. The hats, I'm still doing this. I've been doing this for a while now. I like it. It really summarizes why the presidents go gray in front of your eyes. No, I have only seen one who didn't. That was President Reagan because he was an actor and he always had his makeup on. He is the chief of state. He recognizes or not foreign dignitaries. He's the chief executive. He's responsible for all government activities. He is the chief citizen. He is a representative considered to be of all Americans, which is why many presidents using media attempt to go over the heads of Congress at time by going public with the desire to try to get some legislation passed or some issue addressed. He's commander-in-chief. We have a civilian head of the armed forces. It's not the generals. It's not the admirals. The president is the head of the armed forces. He is the chief administrator. He runs the government. And as chief legislator, he proposes a yearly budget. And those two, the administrator and legislator, go hand in hand. He is the chief diplomat. He negotiates with foreign countries with the check applied by the Senate over any treaties that have been made or over any ambassadors that are important to foreign countries. And the last and least effective hat that is worn by the president is he is the head of the political party. Most politics is locally controlled or state controlled. Uh, the 22nd Amendment, the Republicans gained control of the Congress again in the early 50s and the first thing they did was pass this as a way of getting back at the Democrats and FDR. They had been out of power for a generation and it limited the president to two terms and 10 years maximum service. You can be elected twice only but you can also serve two years of somebody else's term. The Electoral College usually mirrors Congressional representation, it's based on the census that's done every 10 years. It actually elects the president. It meets after the general election in November. They meet in December and they cast their vote. They usually follow the popular vote, but occasionally there are votes as trustees. Because, again, this is a check on the popular vote. And they didn't expect the general public to be able to choose wisely in 1789. The 25th Amendment establishes succession to the presidency out to all of those different cabinet positions. It's established now. That came about in the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination, and it was adopted in 1967. And that is where the speaker comes in after the vice president, after the speaker is the secretary of state, and then I think it's secretary of defense, and so on out. Impeachment has been done by the House twice with Andrew Johnson in 1868 and with William Jefferson Clinton in, 18, or in 1997, 98. Both of those Senate trials failed to convict Johnson or Clinton. They were impeached, but they were not convicted. There are three judicial powers of the presidency, the power of life and death, literally. They can issue reprieves, which are legal forgive, forgiveness of an offense. They can pardon, which commutes the sentence of a convicted criminal. And they can grant amnesty, which is usually done to groups of offenders, such as President Carter did to Vietnam War draft evaders in the very late 1970s. Legislative powers, 
power of veto, the pocket veto, which is used at the end of a legislative session. We've already talked about some of that. And the line item veto is what every president would like to see implemented. That's going to require a constitutional amendment. State governors have this today. In the late 1990s for a time until the Supreme Court invalidated it, President Clinton had the line item veto. And it might be a reason why they were able to balance some budgets by the end of the 1990s. The impact of the Cold War in the New Deal vastly increased presidential war-making powers, the Cold War. It cannot be emphasized enough. And this is where many executive action wars, such as Vietnam, were engaged in because it was believed that we had to do something quickly and we can't wait to convene all the members of Congress, get all of their input on something. And this has been checked by the War Powers Act in the 1970s but all presidents, once they get the office, are very tempted to use the military in order to quickly achieve some kind of solution to foreign policy problems. Presidential government came out of the New Deal. Since the 1930s, we have had more direction from the executive branch than the legislative branch because of all of the different agencies that were created. And in the new textbook on page 189 is a diagram of the institutional presidents, presidency and all of the different resources that are available to the president. That is another reason why the power of this office has increased so much. Executive agreements are between foreign countries and the president. They are used, again, to circumvent the Congress. Executive orders are usually used within the country domestically. It's the rule that has the effect of law. It's a chief executive officer tool. And if the Congress doesn't like the order, then pass another law, which they have the option to do. And that concludes all of the definitions for this particular chapter.